unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. Today is Baptism Sunday. Isn't that exciting? Today, someone is being baptized. Miss Cindy Valentine's being baptized today as she has committed her life to Jesus, and we are celebrating that with her today. One of the things that we do here at Parkgate is one of our traditions is we invite you to come and touch the waters of the baptistry. Not because the water is anything special. It's just good old-fashioned Pasadena tap water, uh, unfiltered, so Cindy, let me know how you feel in a week. <laughs> the reason we do this, though, is to remember and to reflect on what this was like when we took this step, to remind ourselves of why we do this to remember where we have been since we've made that decision. And maybe we're in a place where we got to say, hey, God, I haven't lived up to that commitment that I've made to you. And the great thing about serving Jesus is that's okay. Because he takes on that burden for us. And maybe this is the time you say, hey, God, I'm, I'm sorry. I repent of the sin that I've made and and." rededicate yourself and remember that decision. The other reason we do this is to pray for Cindy and to pray for the decision that she's made and the future that she's going to have and the, and the attack that she's going to find from the enemy over the next season. But it's to pray for her as well. During this time, we're also going to have prayer partners or prayer partners. I'm going to ask that you guys will stand off to the sides over here so we're not congesting this area. And maybe after you touch these waters, you're reflecting on that decision you made a long time ago and you're thinking, hey, I need to spend some time in prayer. Our prayer partners are here for you. Maybe there's something else going on in your life and you need to lift that up to the Father. We would love to be people who pray with you. So prayer partners, please come forward and family, please touch the waters at any time during this next song. Give light, you are love, you bring. 
Your mercy is called. 
Would you pray with me? And so, Lord, we gather this morning to confess that you are good and that you are God and that there is none like you. You are so loving, so wise, so powerful, Lord. You are great. And so, Lord, we ask that you would forgive us for those times where we go against your will and way and we kind of do our own thing and we just do what we want, follow our own desires instead of following you. Lord, would you forgive us and would you help us, Lord? You are worthy of all worship and we give you our praise this morning. Lord, would you continue to bless us and honor us with your presence as we lift you up? Would you give us ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts that can understand what you want to do, not only in our lives, but in the life of your church here at Parker, in your community here in Pasadena? And whatever that is, Lord, may we be faithful. And as we have been praying for other churches, Lord, we lift up to you bread of life, deliverance, and Pastor McDonald, Lord. Would you give that congregation every creative idea, every volunteer, every leader, every dollar that they need to make a massive impact on their community? May they be kingdom-minded and kingdom-oriented. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. It's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Please have a seat. Well, good morning, good morning, everybody. You should have received a weekly when you walked in. On the bottom of that weekly is a connection card. We would ask that you would fill that out. If you are a guest this morning, please fill that out. We would love to send you a little gift in the mail. It's just our way of honoring you for being here this morning. So please allow us to do that. You can put them in the boxes in the back of the room. We have a few announcements that we want to highlight for you. This Wednesday is our Sacred Focus Worship Gathering, where we're going to gather together. We're going to seek the heart of God together, and uh, this is going to help prepare our hearts for the Easter season. Now, Lent doesn't actually begin this Wednesday. It begins the following Wednesday, but the following Wednesday is Valentine's Day. And so we thought, you know, we're going to move the service up a week so that you can still take your special someone out and enjoy a good meal. But this Wednesday, uh, we encourage you to come out. Last year, this was my favorite service of the year. It was just special. There was just such a a thick presence in the room. Uh, I really loved it. And uh, if you come out, I believe that you'll enjoy it and love it as well. This when, excuse me, this Saturday, we will have our Lost Loves dinner. And so we were sitting around last year talking about how can we honor our widows and widowers in the church. And we landed on this idea. Well, why don't we do a dinner? Why don't we just invite them to come out and let them know that they are seen and that they are loved, that they are not alone. And so we have this dinner. And uh, if you fall into that category, you should have received an invitation. If you did not, um, please let us know. We tried really hard to make sure we covered anyone, but everyone, but sometimes things happen. And so let us know. Or maybe you know a, a neighbor, a friend, a family member who would be blessed by coming to something like this. Let us know their names and give us their contact information. We would love to send them a personal invitation as well. And so that will be happening this Saturday. And lastly, one week from today is Pastor Chelsea's last Sunday with us. And we want to honor her. We're going to honor her in service. And after second service, we're going to have a come and go reception out in the Kicks building. And this is just a way to say thank you for seven wonderful years of ministry. So please come out. Make sure you mark your calendar and come out for that event as well. Kiddos, you are dismissed for Kicks. You can go to the people with the signs in the corner of the room. And parents, you can pick them up after the service over here. They're going to come in here for baptism, but we're going to take them back, um, and you can pick them up over there. And as they are leaving, please turn your attention to the screens.
Well, good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. If you will turn in your Bibles to John chapter 3, we're going to be in verses 22 through 35. If you don't have a Bible, you can grab a blue one on the back of the chair in front of you and turn to page 1052. If you ask a musician what the most difficult instrument is to play, you're going to get a myriad of responses. In fact, a quick Google search shows that this is a pretty heated debate. Some say it's the violin, others say the pipe organ, some say the viola, others say the bagpipes. If anybody had the clout and the, reg, uh, the experience to give a definitive answer to this question of what is the most difficult instrument to play, it was the late Leonard Bernstein. Bernstein was a prolific composer of things all sorts of different genres, things from choral works to chamber pieces to symphonies to uh, things like musical theater scores like West Side Story. In addition, he was known as being the prolific conductor of the New York Philharmonic and won countless awards and recognition for his work there. So when an onlooker approached Mr. Bernstein one day and said, what is the most difficult instrument to play? He actually responded without hesitation, and he said this. The second fiddle. I can get plenty of first violinists, but to find someone who can play the second fiddle with enthusiasm, that's a problem. Have you ever had to play second fiddle? Maybe you have an older sibling who lived in the spotlight. They were good at everything, and you felt like you constantly lived in their shadow. Second fiddle. My brother used to just hate it when he was referred to as Chelsea's little brother. It drove him nuts, and rightfully so. Maybe you work on a group project for work or for school. You put all this effort in, and then somebody else gets the credit. Second fiddle. Maybe you're a parent in your chauffeur era, and all you do is drive your kids from one appointment to one lesson to the next thing all across town. You live in your car, and you love your kids, so you're doing it so they can have a good life, but still, second fiddle. Or maybe you played the understudy in the school play, or you were second string quarterback on the football team. Second fiddle. Nobody wants to play second fiddle. In fact, I would say it goes against our instincts. It starts when we're kids and we get so indignant when somebody cuts us in line in the classroom, and then it carries over to when we're adults and we're driving on the interstate and somebody cuts us off and we say some very unchristian things to that car. Nobody wants to play second fiddle because it's tough. And yet that's exactly what John the Baptist was called to do. From the moment that we hear about John the Baptist, when his birth is prophesied in Luke 1, we're told that this guy is going to play second fiddle to Jesus because his purpose is to prepare the way for the Savior. This morning, we're going to watch what happens when John the Baptist's ministry intersects with the arrival of Jesus. We're also going to see how this call to second fiddle extends to us. Because followers of Jesus magnify him and minimize self. In the words of John the Baptist, he must increase and I must decrease. As I said, we're going to be in John chapter 3 verses 22 through 35. But before we go there, how many of you, by raising your hand, have ever been in class with somebody else who had the same first name as you? All right, a decent amount of us. Those of us who've had that experience know that it can make for some confusing times. I made it all the way to 11th grade chemistry before there was another Chelsea in my class. And all of a sudden, I became Chelsea W to her Chelsea S. And then what do you do if you have the same last initial? When I was uh, directing a kids musical at a church I used to serve at, we had three Hannah B's. Three Hannah B's, all under the age of fifth grade. It was very confusing to try to direct them on what to do. So in today's text, I'm referring to multiple Johns. And so in order to try to keep things clear, what the main subject of the text is John the Baptist, but John the Baptist is being written by John the author who wrote the Gospel of John. So I'm going to try to use those terms, John the Baptist or John the author, to try and keep things clear. Our passage is split into two parts this morning. In the first part of the passage, we see John the Baptist addressing his followers and explaining why Jesus must increase and he must decrease. 
Right after that is John the author's reflections on why John the Baptist would always be inferior to Jesus and why Jesus would be superior. Before we dive in, though, I think it's important for us to do a quick review of who John the Baptist is. As many of you know, we're spending this year at Parkgate looking at the Gospel of John, which presents the life of Christ in a very different way than the other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But the trouble is, when it comes to the Gospel of John, it tells us more about who John the Baptist is not than who John the Baptist is. John the Baptist is not the light. John the Baptist is not the Christ. John the Baptist is not Elijah or the prophet. John the Baptist, by his own words, isn't even worthy to untie the straps of Jesus' sandals. Instead, he says he is the voice of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord. That little bit of information that we get isn't even enough to constitute a Cliff Notes version of the guy's life. So for us to better understand John the Baptist, we need to go and look at the other Gospels. And here's what they tell us. John the Baptist shared human lineage with Jesus. He was sent to prepare the way by pointing uh, people to Christ. He preached from the wilderness about the need to repent of sins. He wore clothing made of camel hair and decked it out with a leather belt around his waist. He was known for eating locusts and wild honey, and I guess if you're going to eat locusts, you might as well put honey on top, probably makes it easier to swallow. And he attracted many people, some in a positive way, as he attracted people who wanted to repent or turn away from their sins, but he also attracted some people in more of a negative way, like the religious elite, the religious elite the Pharisees, the Sadducees, who just wanted to come and criticize and correct. He baptized with water as a mark of repentance, and he spoke of one greater who would follow, Jesus. From the get-go, John the Baptist teaches us that followers of Christ magnify him and minimize self. It's important to note that this method of baptism that John, is, John the Baptist is utilizing has some similarities and some differences to the one that we practice today. It's similar in that it's a call for people to turn away from their sins and a symbol of being washed or made clean. But it's different because it does not mark receiving the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit wasn't given to us as believers until after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, this is where it starts, at verse 22. After this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Jordan countryside, where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now, John also was baptizing at Enon near Salim because there was plenty of water and people were coming and being baptized. Scholars agree that this passage takes place before Jesus' public ministry in Galilee begins. We're not exactly sure if John the Baptist has already baptized Jesus at this point. He probably has, but we do know for sure that at the very least, their paths have intersected and they've had a lot of interaction. John the Baptist and Jesus at this point are unified in their ministry goal, though they're practicing that goal in two different locations. Their goal is to declare the arrival of the Savior. We aren't looking for the Messiah to come. He's here already. And they're also calling for people to repent and turn from sins. Both of them included baptism in their ministry, though John the author clarifies for us in chapter 4, verse 2, that uh, Jesus didn't actually do the baptizing. That was the work of his disciples. Verse 24 is a big spoiler alert for us. This was before John was put in prison. This, in, this is telling us that in the extremely near future, John the Baptist is going to be thrown into prison and eventually beheaded because of his allegiance to Jesus. But for now, he is serving wholeheartedly, diligently conducting his call to prepare the way for Jesus, asking people to repent and marking that repentance with water baptism. An argument arises among the crowd that day with John the Baptist. And this argument, uh, on the surface, looks like it's about baptism and about, uh, or ceremonial washing, which was a common practice by devout Jews of the day. Well, that's what it looks like on the surface, but as we read deeper, we see that it's actually about something else. Verse 25, an argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, 
Rabbi, the man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he's baptizing and everyone is going to him. One of the wisest pieces of uh, conflict resolution advice that I was ever given is that the presenting issue is seldom the actual issue. And that's what's going on here. The presenting issue is this baptism or cleansing method debate. But the actual issue is the fact that Jesus has more followers than John the Baptist, which tells us that your follower count was a big deal even before social media was a thing, right? So these guys are arguing back and forth about this. And John, the author, clues us into who the culprit behind this is, as he says, a certain Jew, and that points to the pot stirrer. Now, some scholars say that this was likely a Pharisee, somebody who didn't like this practice of baptism. In those days, if you were a Gentile or a non-Jew and you wanted to convert to Judaism, you would go through a ceremonial washing as a mark of the spiritual threshold that you were crossing. However, if you were already Jewish, there was no need for you to be ceremonially clean. You already were clean in their eyes. And so, why was John going around telling everybody that they needed to repent and to be baptized? Perhaps this Pharisee saw a unique opportunity to prey on the fact that John the Baptist's followers are insecure, and then to rile them up and stir the pot a bit. But John the Baptist recognizes this behavior. Ancient teachers often competed for followers. That was not an uncommon thing. But there were also ancient teachers who got along and actually rooted for each other. The problem was the people that followed them. Their followers couldn't seem to get along. They were the ones who wanted to keep the rivalry going. So when John the Baptist encounters this, he calls it out. And he recognizes that not the presenting issue, but the actual issue is insecurity. And that's why he says this. A person can receive only what is given them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but am sent ahead of him. John the Baptist reminds his followers what he has been telling them all along. I am not the Messiah. Again, John the Baptist shows us that followers of Jesus magnify him and minimize self. He reminds his followers that when it comes to him and Jesus, it's not even a contest. That this conversation, to use a word that's bad with our kids, is stupid. This is a stupid conversation, all right? John the Baptist is saying, I can only do what I have been called to do. I will always take second fiddle to Jesus. And after all, God is the one who's providing the successes and increases in Jesus' ministry. And how crazy is it that we're even trying to make an issue of this and criticize He then models how their response ought to be, one of joy. When ancient Jews pictured joy, they often would picture a wedding. And so John the Baptist uses that analogy in verse 29. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. In this analogy, Jesus is the bridegroom. And John the Baptist, he's the friend of the groom, the best man, so to speak. And it's his joy to serve and honor the bridegroom. This wedding is not about him. Reminded me a little bit of my wedding back in 2019. My three bridesmaids were my cousin Kelsey, my sister-in-law Brandy, and my best friend slash matron of honor Amy. And those three women did an incredible job being the best support to me during a super busy weekend. They were in the kicks building using steamers on tablecloths to make them be straight. When um, the slightly anal bride noticed a typo in the wedding program, they recut them. They made sure that um, I was getting pep talked on married life and what to expect. They proofread my vows. They decked out my bridal suite over in 22B with a bunch of decorations that reminded me of the show Friends just to make me laugh. They prayed for me, they laughed with me, they calmed my nerves. My best friend, who was the matron of honor, Amy, had so many responsibilities that weekend, but managed to take all of these photos. I swear the woman could make a killing as a member of the paparazzi. But she was taking pictures of things that you wouldn't think to get pictures of. And she even got some photos of me with a dear friend I would lose a little over a year later, very unexpectedly. That's a gift I I can't ever even thank her enough for. 
And these women never complained. Brandy was four and a half months pregnant and throwing up all the time. Kelsey flew in through Tropical Storm Imelda from Portland to get here and got delayed a bunch. Amy flew in early, leaving behind her husband and her th three tweens just so she could be a support with me and just be there for me the week of my wedding. These women delighted in me because they loved me. It was my special day and they wanted to keep it that special. That kind of joy is the delight and joy that John the Baptist is expressing about Jesus' ministry. In fact, his entire life is marked by that kind of joy for Jesus. In Luke 141, we're told that when his mother, who was pregnant at the time, encounters Jesus' mom who's pregnant, John leapt in utero because he was delighted to be in the presence of Jesus, of his Savior. John the Baptist's immense joy is that Jesus is receiving glory, honor, and recognition. His joy is fulfilled when Christ is praised and honored by others. Instead of comparing how many followers they have, he's not insecure when Jesus' followers multiply. He's delighted. And that joy leads to what Pastor Kenneth has referred to as John the Baptist's life's mission statement, which says this, He must become greater, I must become less. Other translations, like the English Standard Version, say, He must increase, but I must decrease. And the message paraphrase says, this is the moment for him to move into the center while I slip off to the sidelines. John the Baptist always knew that his ministry had an expiration date. He knew it wasn't always going to be about him. It was necessary for his ministry to drift into the background as Jesus's came to the foreground. And it's really fitting that these are actually the last words that we hear John the Baptist speak in the Gospel of John. Followers of Jesus magnify him and minimize self. So now we transition into John, the author's assessment of what's just occurred. Why does he even feel the need to address this? John the Baptist has been very clear in his response, right? Well, John, the author, writing this in hindsight, knows that there are still people who will continue to follow John the Baptist and refuse to believe in Jesus. In fact, Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 7, tells of some people many years later in Ephesus who were still willing to be full-on Team John the Baptist without being anything but lukewarm in regards to Jesus until God used the Apostle Paul to change their hearts. I think there's some messages in that for us as well. The first is that we can get so engrossed in our support of a particular person, a pastor, a, an author, a politician, a friend, somebody, that then we lose sight of Jesus. Those people don't even have to necessarily have done something bad. We just make them holy or untouchable. We put them on this pedestal. They become an idol to us. If you're more likely to defend a person than you are to defend Jesus, or if you're more likely to fight for the reputation of a politician than you are to fight for the reputation of Jesus, that's a hard issue, and it needs to be addressed. And thing two, we can do all the things that we should do. We can go to church on Sunday. We can serve. We can tithe. We can be the model Christian and go to life group, and we can do all of these things and still miss Jesus. When we make our faith a checklist, we inevitably check out. Because we put Jesus in the back seat and allow our humanity to be in the front seat. Again, a hard issue that needs to be addressed. So here's what John the author tells us. The one who comes from above is above all. He's talking about Jesus. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. That's John the Baptist. The one who comes from heaven, again Jesus, is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. Whoever has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the Spirit without limit. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. John the author is clarifying for us that John the Baptist was always inferior to Jesus. Jesus was always the one who was superior for these four reasons. Number one. Jesus is totally human and totally divine. 
Now, John the author is not picking on John the Baptist here. He's just stating fact. By being totally human and totally divine, Jesus, God made flesh, is always going to be superior to John the Baptist, who's just flesh. And reason two, Jesus speaks from observation, not from theory. Jesus is totally divine, which means he comes from heaven and speaks with a higher authority than a regular human being like John the Baptist. Theologian Gary Burge puts it like this, Jesus is a messenger who reveals what he's seen and heard in heaven's precincts. Third, Jesus speaks the words of God. God sent Jesus and he gives him the words to speak. Now, as is referred to by John the author, sometimes those words are rejected by people, but still God commissions the Son to come. Why? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. John 3, 16. Finally, Jesus has been anointed by the Holy Spirit. God has gifted Jesus with the Holy Spirit in a way that's never been seen or been true of in any other person. Up to this point in the scriptures, anytime someone received the Holy Spirit, it was temporary. It was a temporary indwelling given to them to accomplish a specific task for the Lord. But no one else had had a ministry, their entire ministry, be spirit-filled. The Holy Spirit equips Jesus in a way he's never done before. And something that this passage doesn't mention, but I think is important to note, is that in his tremendous grace, after Jesus came and accomplished what he came here to do, loving the world so much that he gave his life for us, he then gifted believers with the Holy Spirit so that we can continue to carry out God's kingdom work here on earth. And we mark that receiving of the Holy Spirit through water baptism today. This passage is very clear about how we respond. We decrease and watch as Christ increases. Another way of saying this is that followers of Jesus magnify him and minimize self. But what does this look like on a practical level? Well, first, it looks like creating and protecting space to experience Jesus. Magnifying Jesus takes intentionality, effort, and commitment. It's not just going to happen on its own accord. So we work to develop rhythms where we can experience Jesus on a daily basis and we listen for his voice. Corey Tim Boom, who was a Dutch Christian writer and public speaker who came to be known because her and her family worked to uh, free Jews from, um, and release them from Nazi imprisonment during World War II, she said this, If the devil cannot make us bad, he will make us busy. The first time I heard that, I felt like the Holy Spirit was like point, point, jabbing me in the shoulder. Like, hey, that's you. Guess what? That's you. I'm really good at going 150 miles per hour in the name of Jesus, right? I've spent the last 14 years in full-time ministry doing that. And it's had ups and downs and it's been good. And I'm so grateful for the privilege of doing it. But as Pastor Kenneth shared, this is actually my last message here at Parkgate, and I'm getting ready for my last Sunday because the Holy Spirit has been inviting me to slow down. He's asking me to come and experience his presence in a different way and to protect that. My husband and I are still feeling this call into ministry together, and we don't believe that our time in serving in ministry is by any means done. We actually feel like it's only just beginning. But until we know what's next, the Holy Spirit has invited me to rest. But here's what I know. I'm about to be gifted with a bunch of time, as much time as a mom of a 20-month-old can have, and I'm going to have to fight to protect that time because my humanness is going to want to fill it up with a bunch of different things, toddler story time, trips to the zoo, things like that. You know, rearrange the whole house. Jacob's going to come home from work and be like, put the label maker down, Um, (laughs) which has maybe been said before. Uh, but I say all that to say that what, what I'm going to have to do is fight to create and protect that space. I know me. I know what I'm prone to do. So I'm going to fight to create and protect. Guys, busyness is a status symbol in our society. But sometimes magnifying Christ actually looks like being less busy so that we can experience him more fully. So... Just like I've asked myself, where do you need to create more space to experience Jesus? 
What are you doing to protect that space? Magnifying Jesus on a practical level looks like creating and protecting space to experience him, and it also looks like combating the poison of pride by pointing others to Jesus. Now, when I hear the word poison or venomous and I think of animals, I do not think of this guy. I just don't. Ever seen a puffer fish? Okay. So a puffer fish has, is known for taking its elastic stomach and inflating itself to appear up like tons times bigger than it actually is so that it can defend itself from predators. But what it's actually doing, like that's cute, like cute, you blew yourself up. But what's underneath is toxic. It's poison. There's a toxic, a toxic substance inside of pufferfish that is so deadly to other fish and to human beings. That little friend up there can produce a poison that is 1,200 times more powerful and deadly than cyanide. All right? One pufferfish can kill 30 human beings, and there's no known antidote. Like a pufferfish, we can blow ourselves up, make ourselves look good. Humble brag, humble brag, humble brag, right? But underneath what's really there is toxic, it's poisonous, and it's pride. Consider John the Baptist. He easily could have become prideful. My parents were geriatric when they had me. It was a miraculous birth. <gasps> oh, on top of that, God hasn't spoken to humanity for 400 years, and he chose me to be the vessel he speaks through. <gasps> Oh, also, I'm so holy that I wear animal skins and live in the wilderness and eat bugs. <gasps> All right, but every time that we look at John the Baptist, what he actually does is points people back to Jesus. <sighs> All right, he doesn't allow that poison of pride to define his ministry. He took every opportunity that was a celebration of him and turned it and made it about Jesus. So we combat the poison of pride in our lives by pointing others to Jesus. If that poison of pride threatens your life, and newsflash, you're a human being, so it does, then we combat that by steering people to Jesus. We seek God's direction when we're making big decisions. We put other people first. We care more about God than what the world says. We give Jesus credit, and we thank him for the good things that he's doing in our lives. And we just do these things, not to get the attention of others, but just to point out Christ organically by the way that we live. We magnify Jesus and point others to him. We make successes in our lives about Jesus, not about ourselves. Where do you need to fight that poison of pride in your life? And where can you point others to Jesus? Finally, we delight in the work of Jesus in the lives of others. John the Baptist's followers wrestled with insecurity because they were making a comparison they were never going to win. They were comparing the ministry of their leader against Jesus. There was always going to be insecurity when they were doing that because John the Baptist's ministry was always going to pale in comparison to what Jesus was doing. How often do we fall prey to the trap of comparison? Social media was pretty much invented for us to compare ourselves to other people. We're scrolling along and, oh, hey, there's somebody I haven't seen in 15 years, but their life looks like they've got it better than mine. Well, and then I start to get jealous. Or I'm scrolling along and, oh, my gosh, that person from second period history class got a better Christmas present than I did? What's wrong with me? Or we think about our neighbor down the street who posted a picture of a vacation at a really trendy resort, and we're like, well, I'm not going to post pictures of my annual camping trip because I'm going to look lame, right? We make it all about comparison, and it's so ludicrous, and yet we do it over and over and over and over again. And even churches fall victim to this. Well, Parkgate is way better than every other church because we're doing X, Y, Z. Well, I could never worship there because they do this. Or, how is it that that church is growing? They're not doing all the things that we're doing. That's why I think it's really cool how every Sunday, well, most Sundays we try to, pray for other churches around our area, in our movement, because what it does is it challenges us to ask God's blessing and favor on other bodies of believers and reminds us that Parkgate is not the only church that's doing good things for God's kingdom. So the next time that you're tempted to compare when envy lurks, when you're scrolling, what would it look like to stop right then and there and thank Jesus for what he's doing in somebody else's life? Oh, I'm feeling jealous about that neighbor. God, thank you that you let them go on a trip as a family and for the ways that you are using that to bond them together. 
Oh, I'm jealous of a Christmas present. God, would you please convict me of the envy in my heart and thank you for blessing that person with that gift. All right, so, oh, they've got their life together. Lord, I'm sure that that's not actually true. Social media is a mask. I pray for the things that are actually going on in that person's life. What if our scrolling became less of just a mindless task and it turned into an opportunity to genuinely engage the Lord in prayer? How can you celebrate what God is doing in somebody else's life? Don't make their successes about your insecurity. Make it about magnifying Jesus. Where can you delight in Jesus' work in a friend? That delight magnifies Jesus. It minimizes you, and that's called humility. If I ask for you to picture somebody in more recent history that epitomized humility, I wonder who you would think of. My guess is a lot of us would think about Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa was a nun who gave her life to serving the most poor and desolate people in Calcutta, India. And as she did so, she became known for her selflessness. On October 27, 1979, she received the Nobel Prize for Peace. But in an unprecedented move, she decided that she was going to refuse the traditional Nobel banquet, this big dinner that they would throw beforehand. That dinner, back in the 70s, cost $192,000 to put on. In today's terms, that's over 800 grand. She requested instead that those funds be donated to the charities that she was working with that would help the poor people she lived and served among. And after what had to be like the most Nobel Prize worthy thing possible that anybody could have done, she had the audacity to get up there and when she came to accept the award, she said, I'm not worthy of receiving it. How does somebody become that humble? 10 years later, in an interview with Time Magazine, this is what Mother Teresa said. I am like a little pencil in God's hand. That's all. He does the thinking. He does the writing. Followers of Jesus magnify him and minimize self. They become little pencils in the hand of a God who is writing a bigger story than they could ever imagine. As they work to become more and more at peace with just being this vessel, we create and protect space to experience God. We combat the poison of pride by pointing others to Jesus. And we delight in the work that Jesus is doing in the lives of others. This morning, we want to give you an opportunity to respond to this message. First, we want to invite you to take communion. Communion is that time when we remember the most humble one of all, Jesus, and how he took our sins, our shame, and carried them to that cross on our behalf. We remember what he has done as we take the bread and the juice. During this final song, you're invited to respond in that way. As you come forward, you'll notice there's ba uh, baskets uh, next to the elements. And in those baskets are a bunch of little pencils. I'm a visual person. I need a cue to remind me of what I've heard. And so I wanted to provide you with a little pencil. And maybe this pride thing is something you're combating. And you need to stick this in the place where you're going to see it and remember every day that you're just a little pencil in God's hand. And to lean into that and to trust. And finally... I recently came across this style of praying that's called breath prayer. And essentially, it's praying in a very simplistic way. I pray one thing as I breathe in, and another thing as I breathe out. And so I want to invite you to pray, and as you breathe in, you say, Jesus, he must increase. And as you breathe out, I must decrease. He must increase. I must decrease. That's how I prayed as I prepared for our message today. I'll tell you, it's a very centering and humbling way to pray. And so as we close our time together this morning, during this final song, you may take communion, you can grab a pencil, and would you pray, Jesus, would you increase, and may I decrease. Let's pray together. Father God, we confess that all too often we make this life thing all about us. You have gifted us your son, Jesus. And yet, instead of increasing his name, his fame, his glory in our lives, we make it about us. 
We pray that this morning, the way that your Holy Spirit has already been poking us in the shoulder and convicting us would carry on. And that we would have the boldness and the bravery to take these words and to consider them and to become people who are willing to decrease, to move into the background so that you can come into the foreground. Please forgive us for the places where pride and comparison have plagued us. And Lord, make us more like your son, Jesus. We love you. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. You may come.
Would you pray with me? So, Lord, we thank you for your amazing grace. And would you give us the grace to decrease so that you may increase. In the decisions we make, in the things that we do, in our life in general, may you increase and may we decrease. And may we be a people that point other people to you. In the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Please have a seat for a moment. I'm going to invite my friend Cindy to come up. She's not nervous at all, at all. So Cindy has been at Pargate for uh, a couple years now, and uh, she has always known that there is something out there. She believed that there was, there was a God but she wasn't following Jesus, and she wasn't surrendered to Him. And as I said, she came about a couple years ago, and she started listening to the messages. And all of a sudden, something started to grow on the inside, right? And uh, she decided, you know what? I'm going to explore this. I'm going to pursue this. And uh, a couple weeks ago, she came into my office, and we talked about what following Jesus looks like. And we talked about what being baptized looks like. And I asked her some questions, and uh, one of the questions I ask everybody who gets baptized is, are you willing to go 100% all the way in with Jesus, no turning back? And you said, a big old yes. That's right. And so we want to say that we're proud of you. This is a massive step that you're taking. Even today, you told me that you wanted a, a new chapter, right? And so this is your new chapter. This is the beginning of it. And so I would like to read to you a verse from Ephesians. This is Ephesians 4, 1 and 2. You get two verses. Usually people get one. So here it is. As a prisoner of the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. So I'd like to ask you three questions. Have you repented of all your sin? Yes. Have you asked Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life? Yes. And you promise to serve Him all the days of your life? Yes. All right. We're going to help you in here. With the by the profession of your faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Before we go from here, don't forget to come give Cindy a hug and celebrate with her as she has made this proclamation, friends. As, as you're leaving, don't forget to drop your connection cards in the offering boxes on your way out the door. We've got Sacred Focus this Wednesday. Kenneth said it was his uh, favorite service of the year. Thanks for setting the bar low there, bud. Uh, now i got to live up to that. Oh, better yet, I don't got to live up to anything. That's, that's Jesus. I'll live, let him handle that. I'll just show up. <laughs> uh, invite you out to that 7 o'clock. Impact uh, is going to be joining us. There's still Kicks programming 
for those kiddos. Um, uh, Saturday is our Lost Loves. If you or know someone who is a widow or widower, please make sure they are RSVPing by tomorrow. And next Sunday is Chelsea's final Sunday with us. Uh, let's be here and celebrate with her and the Haynes family for all that they as a family have contributed to Parkgate over the past seven years. Um, at that, friends. Oh, lastly, if you're a visitor with us, we're, uh, some of our pastoral staff, we're going to be over here in this room right here. We call it our one five meet and greets because it's called our one five because it's one five minute conversation. We just would love to get to know you, uh, see your face, shake your hand and hear a little bit about your story. Uh, we promise we won't be weird. Just want to meet you. At that, friends, let's say our benediction verse together. Here is my command. Love one another just as I have loved you. No one has greater love than the one who gives their life for their friends. Jesus matters. Love God. Love people. Love now. Go in peace.